need to stand, talking about the Bible. All right, let's say this together. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. Now you may be seated. Except Josh. Josh has to stand for the entire service. (laughs) Um, For those of you that don't know me, I'm Danny. I'm the one they keep hidden under the stage until Tom leaves and then pull out on special occasions. Um, I'm just really thankful for the ability to come back and be able to speak again. Uh, It just... It's such a blessing to me that I get to um, do this here in front of a group of people that I love so much and who I know some of you love me. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's really good, and, and uh, God has really been speaking things to me since the last time and, and impressing things upon me that uh, I feel the need to share this morning, so uh, I hope you all enjoy what I have to say. <laughs> um, how has uh, Summer Together been for you guys so far, the one service? Is everyone liking this? Yeah. I certainly am liking this. I'm liking the sleeping in portion, um, which I know we, we discussed maybe not saying that we like the sleeping in portion because it's less spiritual to sleep in on a Sunday, but, well, I'll take it. Um, one of the other benefits, having, yeah, <laughs> having spoken on a non-Summer Together Sunday and now on a Summer Together Sunday with one service versus two, like, not having to recycle the jokes for two services, so good. Because, like, you say them in the first service, you get a really good laugh, and even the people at the back laugh, but then in the second service, it's all new people in the audience, and they laugh, but then the people at the back are looking at you like, you, you said that one. <laughs> of course I said that one. I don't come up with these on the spot. I practiced for months. <laughs> uh, so we'll just jump right into Scripture this morning. I wanted to go to the book of Joshua. We're going to go Old Testament. So if you have your Bible, uh, open up to Joshua chapter 3. Specifically, I'm going to be reading verses 5 to 8 and verses 14 to 17, because I like to hop around a little bit. Um, Just to give you some context, what's happening at this point, um, the Israelite people had been wandering the desert for a very long time. Um, And then finally, after all that wandering, they had come to the Promised Land, which was just on the other side of the Jordan River. So they're all kind of camped on the banks of the river and staring across the water at the land that will one day be their home, that they have to go in and conquer, that God has asked them to take. Um, Their leader is Joshua, and he's kind of prepping them for this. Uh, And so it's at that point that we come into chapter 3, and in verse 5 it says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they took up the Ark and went ahead of the people. Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall, moreover, command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan... You shall stand still in the waters. Then down in verse 14 it says, So when the people set out from their camp to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and when those who carried the Ark came to the Jordan and their feet stepped in the water uh, and dipped over their knees, for the Jordan was at flood stage at this point, the waters which were flowing down from above stood still and rose up in one heap a great distance away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan. And those which were flowing down towards the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho, and the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on the dry land until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. So... I, uh, I think that when it comes to that story, we who live in Vancouver, a city of bridges and tunnels and ferries, kind of have lost the concept of what it means to cross a large river as a big group of people. Because, I mean, for me, I cross like three bridges one way and two bridges the other day, and, you know, like we, we cross rivers all the time, it's no big deal. But for them, 
it was quite a big deal, the first issue that they would have is just the sheer number of them. This was not like 12 guys hoping to get across the river, like maybe if we build a boat, we can all get on. Uh, in the book of Numbers, it holds that the number of healthy men in the group at the time was about 600,000. So if you do some you know, generic calculations, some scholars estimate that there was about 2.5 million people standing beside this river, which is a lot of people. That's like 2.5 million people. And, <laughs> and only 600,000 of them are like strong men. The rest are, you know, women, children, the elderly, the pregnant, the infirm, the sick, animals, carts, wagons, all of their belongings. They have like everything all pressed up against the banks of the river. And I don't know if you've seen pictures of the promised land, but trees are not easy to find. There's not like a whole ton of nice big cedars so they could make, you know, uh, canoes or something. This was like, they're all just standing, you're going to have to swim, I guess, is what's going to happen. Which brings me to the second problem, uh, which is people that live in a desert for 40 years don't know how to swim, as a general rule. And I can say that because I was a lifeguard, uh, and I have way too many encounters with people who don't know how to swim, uh, and that was like my bread and butter was people that don't know how to swim. In fact, something that you learn as a lifeguard is that there's certain, there's a cultural aspect to swimming. So like I grew up here, I grew up with a backyard pool, my parents took me to the lake, they took me to the ocean all the time, so I just assumed like, isn't swimming just natural for everyone? Don't you just know how to swim from birth? <laughs> And then I became a lifeguard and a swim instructor and found out that not only do people not know how to swim, but certain places in the world, it's just not cultural to swim. Like, who would do that? There's no public pools and the water's not very clean or, or there's sharks, so don't. Um, and, you know, it was just a really interesting thing for me to learn that there are people that don't know how to swim and that then it was my responsibility to jump in and swim on their behalf. Uh, one time I was at Lynn Canyon which is in the North Shore, and it's a really beautiful park if you ever want to go there. And uh, sometimes I like to swim there in the summer, um, which can be pretty dangerous because the water runs really quickly, and it's freezing cold, and there are waterfalls that you can get sucked over into very big drops. So you kind of have to know what you're doing, and you have to be a strong swimmer to be able to swim there. And one time, it was I think it was with Braden, we, <laughs> we show up, and... We're kind of climbing down to one of our favorite spots, and it's this really big pool at the top of a really high waterfall. And I'm looking at this pool, and I can't believe my eyes. There's three guys in, like, street clothes, and they've got, they're, they're like, holding each other's hands, and they're trying to, like, cross the river without swimming. And I, I swam over to them, because they're, like, right at the top of the waterfall. The middle guy was, like, being pulled over the waterfall. I'm like, do you, do you guys need any help? Like, what's happening? They're like, no, we're fine. So they get to the other side by using like a pulley system, and then they're now trapped in a, in a canyon at the top of a cliff at the top of a waterfall. And it's at that point that they decide to tell us that they don't know how to swim. And I'm thinking, why did you do this to yourself? Oh, we wanted to see, we wanted the view. Is it worth it? Is it worth the view? Uh, they ended up making it out okay, I think. We, we ended up leaving because, and I don't want to be responsible for that, there's the three of them. The other thing, I, like, I grew up thinking that swimming was fairly intuitive, like it just makes sense. You put yourself in water, and you push the water this way, I go this way, it makes sense. And learning to teach swimming lessons, one of the things they teach you is just about how unintuitive swimming is. Stuff like, you know, if you, if you think about it, actually going like this doesn't push you that way nearly as much as going like this, but people wouldn't think to do that. And so you get these people trying to learn to swim, and, and they kind of do this like, kick grab thing and and it's really funny to watch until they hit the deep end then it stops being funny and starts being darn it I got I got to get wet now and uh, I was teaching uh, like a teens class and teaching all these teenagers how to swim and there was this one kid in the class who was just such a know-it-all which just gets on my nerves because I know it all so I know that he doesn't <laughs> duh and so the whole class, he's like, I got this, I got this, I got this. And so I was teaching one day, and then immediately after, I had to go into lifeguarding. So I get changed, come out on deck, and I'm, I'm just walking around guarding, and I'm, I'm looking over at the shallow end of the lap pool, and he's teaching his mom how to swim. And so this is a kid who doesn't know how to swim, and actually failed the class. 
trying to teach his mother, who also doesn't know how to swim, how to swim. And I'm kind of watching this, and they're in the shallow end, so I don't really care that much. And, and he's teaching her wrong. And, and you know, like, don't worry, Mom, I know it. I know it. I went to two classes already. And uh, so then he convinces her to swim across the deep end, because how better to learn than to put yourself in danger? And so I'm watching her, and she was making it. She was doing really well. And the problem with, with lifeguarding is you can't actually jump in and preemptively save them. You have to wait until they're drowning, because otherwise they get mad at you. <laughs> so I'm like watching her, and, and she's kind of making it, and kind of making it, and she gets to like the middle of the deep end, and she sits bolt upright, which is never a good move when you're swimming. And she just goes, one, two, three, gone, and just right to the bottom. And so I had to jump in and pick her up. All of this to say, swimming, not an easy thing to teach 2.5 million people in the span of like a couple days so you can get across a really big river. Uh, and then that brings me to the third problem, which was that the river, like I read, was at flood stage, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a big deal. Like this is a big river. And not only is it regularly a big river, but this is the time of year when it's even bigger. It's like the biggest that it is throughout the entire year. So it's huge with tons of water, undercurrents, and like there's no way you're getting across it. I actually have a picture uh, on one of these slides of the Alex Fraser Bridge because I got a, like an old biblical something or other that told me how far across the Jordan was at flood stage. And it was approximately the same as the Alex or the Fraser River under the bridge. So you have 2.5 million people standing at around where the Great Pacific Forum is, and they need to get to Annis's Island, and you have no bridge, and you have no boats, and you have like a whole bunch of goats, and like carts, and children, and good luck. So it was very impossible. This wasn't like somewhat impossible, this was very impossible. And that's not even counting the fact that they were about to go into a place they would have to fight and wage war. So now, the, like, you, you try and swim it, you lose half your people down the river and all your goats. You make it to the other side, you're soaked, you're like sputtering, and then the people from Jericho just come out and they're like, ha ha, got ya. Um, the, the fact that it was so impossible makes the story so much better because this wasn't something that they probably could have done if they had to set their minds to it. This is something that they definitely needed God for. So... God showed up. And what did God do? He told the priests, go stand in the water. So he told a group of people who don't know how to swim, pick up the really big golden box that's super heavy, walk into that flooded river, and stand up to your waist in water for a while. And he didn't say, and if you do that, it will all be great. Everyone will fly. He just said, go do that. And so I really, like, this is a shout out to the priests in that moment who <laughs> picked up the big golden box and stood in the river not knowing what was going to happen. Like, that is faith. That right there. Does anyone here, anyone here who doesn't know how to swim or, does, or knows someone who doesn't know how to swim, tell them to pick up something really heavy and go stand in waist deep river and, like, God will show up. It'll happen. <laughs> Just trust me. Um, so we have the first part, which is that it was super impossible. We have the second part, where God then tells them to do something totally scary and possibly dangerous. But then it moves into my favorite part, which is the third part, where God showed up and the river stopped. And uh, when it, I read that part, it says that, you know, the water stopped flowing from here to there. I kind of picture, there's like an old art piece that I always picture where it shows them like walking in the middle of the river and the water's like coming up on both sides of them and it's about like 40 feet across and they're all kind of going in groups of two or three down the river. But when you actually read it, it says that the water stopped flowing for a great distance and it gives you two like towns. It says the water stopped flowing here and stood up and then it stopped all the way to here. And the distance, again, I put it into like BC terms. This is like a whole bunch of people at the Fraser River under the Alex Fraser Bridge waiting to cross and then the priests put up the big heavy thing on their shoulders and they step into the water. And as soon as they step into the water, all the water starting at Fort Langley in the entire Fraser River immediately stops all the way to the ocean. That's like past Surrey, Maple Ridge, Pitt Meadows, all of it, all gone. Richmond is now like a beautiful suburb and not an island waiting for an earthquake to wash it away. Like, it's all the whole river. Like, I, 
I've been on top of all of those bridges and looked down at the Fraser and thought, goodness, that is a lot of water all the time. And God just went, no, nah, it's good. It's fine. Just walk. It's, it's just like a, a meadow now, <laughs> the meadow of the Jordan instead of the river. And uh, I love that I got to experience thinking that because I'm a very, like, cinematic thinker. And so to go from, like, all of them squeezing between, like, the water, the water stopped for us, to a part where 2.5 million of them could have stood arm in arm and just walked really demonstrates to me that God didn't just say, like, okay, I'm going to help you a little bit. He just did it. He, whoop, he just did the whole thing. Um, so I have a few major points that I found when reading this and when studying it um, that I think are important. The first one, which was very evident from the testimonies given this morning, is that miracles exist, which is getting to be more and more of a controversial thing to say these days. Um, but I firmly, firmly believe that miracles exist. And I'm not talking about, like, the miracle of childbirth, although that's a miracle. I'm not trying to come down on childbirth. But I mean, like... Like, miracles, like, out of this world, somebody that was blind seeing, somebody's leg regrowing, an entire river just stopping flowing so that somebody could cross it. That kind of miracle. Those exist, and they exist today. Uh, who here has seen the movie The Prince of Egypt? Really good animated film. If you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. Um, but it kind of chronicles the exodus and the, the people of Israel leaving uh, Egypt. And when DreamWorks was making that movie... Because that story is told in the biblical Old Testament and in Jewish scripture and in uh, Islamic scripture, they wanted to be really, really careful not to tick anybody off. So they had, um, you know, like multiple scholars from all three of those religions come and sit on a board. And every time they made a decision about the movie, they would take it to them and say, you know, what do you think? Is this going to make any of your people riot? And they'd be like, hmm, maybe. Uh, one of them was they had... They had somebody doing the voice of God, and then none of the scholars could agree on how God's voice was supposed to sound. Like, is it a guy voice? Is it a girl voice? Is it high? Is it low? So they ended, they ended up, in an attempt to appease everybody, have 40 people stand in a room and say the lines all at the same time and just be like, God's like a whole bunch of people talking <laughs> simultaneously. I'm like, I could have done with just three, but, but sure. Uh, and there was a bunch of other, incon like, they, they took the color of the, that they painted the skin of the people to the, to the group. They were like, is this color going to make anybody angry? <laughs> were they this color? I don't know. I don't care. Uh, but one of them was a song, uh, and I think it's called If You Believe, but I've always called it There Can Be Miracles. Um, and it's, like, really, really, I'm not going to sing it, but I'm not going to sing it <laughs> for you. But, uh, yeah, she could sing it. She's gorgeous. Um, but the actual song, it says, like, there can be miracles uh, when you believe. And uh, there's a version by Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston that is phenomenal. But the original song was actually written as, you can do miracles if you believe. And they took that to the board of people. And the board of people said, whoa, you know, that sounds like, like, they're, like, the person is doing the miracle and not God doing the miracle through the person. And I thought, okay, that's a, you know, that's a fair point. It's a fair point. So they changed it, uh, and they changed the song to, um, you can see miracles when you believe. And they took that to the board. And again, the board was like, well, well I mean, like, miracles are more of a metaphorical thing. I don't know if we want to be telling people that they can actually see them. They're more of like a... You know, you wake up and it's a sunny day. That's a miracle every day. I don't, like, you can't, really, it's, not, it's not something we want to tell people that they can see miracles all the time. So eventually they changed the song to, there can be miracles when you believe. And at that point, I'm like, just go all the way and call it, there might be miracles, but we're not really sure and we don't want to put our foot down on anything. <laughs> that chorus wouldn't have sounded good even with Mariah Carey. <laughs> I just think, like, in a culture today that is trying to erase the reality of the miraculous, God does miracles. He heals people. And, and he, uh, you know, does, uh, like, the uh, Young Adults Retreat is a perfect example. When we were up at Young Adults Retreat, Leanne comes into the cabin, and she goes, have you seen your tire? Which is never what you want to hear when you're about an hour up a dirt road. And I was like, like, in general or recently or what? So I come out and look, and my tire is flat, like just on the ground. The whole car's tilted. 
Um, so I was like, well, there's nothing we can do but pray over this. So we prayed, and I drove on a flat tire back to Chilliwack. And in Chilliwack, I filled it up with some air, but knew that it would probably, I mean, it had gone flat in about six hours from when we arrived to when she warned me about it. So, I mean, there was very little chance that it would be good. But we prayed over it nonetheless, and the next day, it was still full of air. And the day after that, it was still full of air. And you're probably thinking, like, really, does God heal cars? Is he up to everything these days? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, those who know, or those who have me on Facebook, you're welcome. Uh, he also... <laughs> He also heals computers, which is a big deal for me because I love my computer. Um, Tom would say you can't love something, can't love you back, but I totally disagree. I love my computer. <laughs> and uh, I turned it on, this was like a month ago now, I turned it on and it was giving me like the weirdest screen. And I'm, I'm fairly good with computers, like I'm good enough to know how to Google my problems, which <laughs> I keep telling my parents how to do, but no matter what, they just turn to me and ask me. And I'm like, just Google it. They're like, why is the screen blue? Just Google, why is the screen blue? And you'll get your answer. But then when they do it, they type in screen blue, why? I'm like, that's not what I said. Anyway. Um, <laughs> last time I complimented them when I preached, so this time I get to harass them. Uh, but anyway, my computer was all messed up. The screen was going crazy, and I'm thinking, like, I can't deal with this right now. Like, this is a very expensive fix. Uh, I hope that somebody can help me fix my computer. So I took it to three different experts getting farther and farther away. I went to one, like, really close to here, went to one kind of out in Newton, and then eventually one all the way out in Langley. And all of them gave me the same news. Nope, it's, it's done. It's toasted, fried. You're going to need to spend at least $900 to fix this problem if you don't have to buy a computer. Uh, and so I'm driving home from Langley, and I just started to pray, like, God, please fix my computer. I, I can't afford a $900 fix on this computer, but I really need it for work and, and such. And uh, so I just prayed all the way back, and I came, set my computer on my desk, turned it on, and it was perfectly fine. Like, nothing had gone wrong. And it sounds so silly, like, why would God do that? What, doesn't he have better things to do? Aren't there people starving somewhere that he could be with? And he is with them, but that doesn't mean he's not with us in all of these little things and willing to move heaven and earth for you all the time for almost any reason. Like, he doesn't need you to be almost dead for him to show up and work miracles. He loves working miracles. He loves showing you that he loves you. And so when we ask for miracles, we can expect them to happen because miracles exist. Uh, point number two is tying back to those priests stepping out in the river. And that is that God does want that from us. He wants us to step out in faith. And he wants that for a couple reasons. One, uh, it grows us. When you have to take those steps of faith, it makes you grow. And the more often you do it, the larger the step can be each time. So the first time, it's maybe like a little step, which feels like a big step to you, but the more you do that, the more you practice taking those leaps of faith, eventually they will become leaps, and eventually it'll feel so natural that you can just step out, step out, step out. But he needs us to do that, and it's not like a, you have to do this to earn this miracle or to earn my love or to be worthy. We're already worthy. He sees us as worthy. He, like I said, he loves us. He has value in us. But he wants us to be the best us that we can be. And we're not going to be the best us that we can be if he just keeps giving us things and we just get to sit back in our comfort zone and never do anything. That being said, stepping out in faith can be really terrifying. I can swim really well. So I personally, if I was one of those priests, would have had an easy time. Like, yes, let me step out in the river and, with the heavy box on my shoulders. That's fine. But then there's other times where God says, hmm, you know that person in Starbucks that you overheard saying how much their back hurts? You don't know them. Walk up to them and ask if you can pray for them. It's like, oh, can I drown instead? <laughs> Is that still on the table? Like, there's certain things, and for some people, that would be the easiest thing in the world. Like, Karen always comes into work, and she says these things that she does with Kathy. Like, oh, we just picked up some guy at the side of the road and evangelized him for two hours. I'm like, what? Uh, how? <laughs> how did you do that? Tell me your secrets. <laughs> and, and so, like, God has put us all in different spaces, so what might be a step out for you might not be a step out for other people. But it's still, those times will come when God is asking you to do something, and you know when he is. 
Sometimes we try and play it off like, no. It was just me thinking about doing that, not God. God, if you really wanted me to pray for that person, you would have thrown fire from heaven. And don't tempt him, he will. But, <laughs> but don't, try and, don't try and laugh off when God is actually calling you to take a step of faith. I know that it's scary, but just take the deep breath and do it because miracles exist, but the step of faith is an integral part of us seeing those things and, and uh, really working out the plan that God has for us. My third point is the really encouraging one, because to follow the scary one, uh, and that is that God never just scrapes by. And this to me was so apparent in how much of the river he dried up in that story. He never does things halfway, and he doesn't just like partially do things, like, oh God, I have you know cancer all throughout, heal me, and we pray, and then God removes it from like here and leaves all of it. That doesn't happen, he doesn't do that. God goes out of his way to perform big grand gestures because he's a romantic and he loves to woo us. And th the things that he does for us, when we pray, I think sometimes we pray and we have an outcome in mind and it's usually a lot smaller than what God actually wants to do. So we say, God, I'm, you know, I'm struggling in my finances right now and I need in better employment. God, could you please give that to me? And what we're picturing is like a, a dollar an hour raise or something. Don't settle for less. God is willing to give you, if, you're, if that's something you need, something you want, and your, your needs aren't being met, and you pray for it, God's willing to just pour money on you. God's willing to pour healing on you. He's willing to do so many things for you if you just ask him and earnestly take that step of faith and seek him. But sometimes we, we put him in this box like, like a miracle is work for him. This is someone who made the earth in seven days. Starting your car again when it's dead in a bad part of town is not a problem for him. <laughs> but we have to ask, and we have to take the step of faith, and we have to believe for those big things. We have to have the faith to say, you know what? In my mind, this isn't even possible, let alone like this little piece is impossible. This big piece is just beyond impossible. We just have to say, but God, you do the impossible. That's your thing. That's like your job title is doer of impossible things. That's what he wears on his name tag. And we can bank on that every time because he will keep coming back. He will keep doing the impossible things because God is the same God that made the blind men see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. He's the same God who had a kid bring him his lunchbox and he fed 5,000 people with it. This is the same God that walked up to a tomb and told a guy who'd been dead and rotting for a couple days, wake up, and he got up like he was just having a nap. That same God is the same God today. He didn't stop doing those things. He's still doing those things, and we can bank on that every time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my final point is very, for us, for this church, um, and it's because I think that there is a very big thing that we have been called to do. There is a Jordan River that we've been asked to cross, and it is scary, and it is terrifying, and it is the new building that we are trying to build. And uh, it, it is terrifying. Like, it's a lot of money, and it's a lot of work, uh, and it's, you know, it's going to be very difficult. But at the same time, when I read what God has done, uh-oh, I chased the youth out. Darn it. I'm sorry. When I read what God has done in the Bible, I know that for him, it's not even close to impossible. In fact, it's just super easy, but he wants us to be there with him. He doesn't want us to just sit back and say, God, can you build it? He wants us to, to, to march forward, to take those steps, of, to grow as a group of people in love with each other, in love with him, in relationship, getting better at what he's called us to do. And we've titled the whole experience ministry expansion and kind of made this weird divide, in my opinion, weird, between expanding spiritual ministry and expanding the physical building. And, and you know, there's constant talk about, like, well, if it's just about a building but not about this, but if it's just about this, we also need the building. And I don't think that bricks and mortar and wood are any less spiritual just because they're physical. I think that God is the God who will bless us physically as well as the God who will bless us spiritually. And yes, he wants to see our ministries grow, but he also wants to see this place grow so that we can fit more ministries. And I don't think that it's wrong to pray for the physical things. Uh, and 
So when we go today to the after-service prayer, and I hope that you'll join me, we'll do it, probably I think we will take 10 minutes, because just in case people want a hot dog, I know I do, I'm starving. <laughs> but um, when we go out there today, I really felt like prayer for the building specifically is what we need to aim for today. And yes, it's important to pray for the expansion of our ministries and that more people would come into this place and know God. But we also have a responsibility. God has called us to build a building, so we have a responsibility to seek him for that thing and to pray for it and to believe that just like he stopped the waters of the Jordan for the Israelites, that he will help us accomplish what we have been asked to accomplish. Thank you. So with that, uh, let's bow our heads and, and we'll pray and <clears throat> then we'll close. God, you are so amazing. You do so many good works. You do so many things on our behalf, so many things that we probably don't even see. And so we just, we just praise you for that, God, and we thank you for all that you do. And we just ask that you would give us faith, that you would give us the gift of boldly seeking you, God, that you would put those opportunities in front of us and that you would give us the will to succeed, God, that you would put those leaps of faith out in front of us and that we would see them and that we would conquer them every time, God. And I just pray right now over... Um, our prayer time and over that building, God, that you would uh, open our hearts to hear you, God, and that you would open uh, up doors and windows, God, to be able to see your plan for this place and for this new building that we're building. Um, and God, I just ask overall that you would just unite this church in this time of summer together and into the future, God, that you would bring us together as a group of people more and more in tune and in love with each other and with you every day. Uh, you can keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. If there's anyone here that does not know Jesus as their Savior, but would love to know the God who comes into your life and works miracles, you can just raise your hand now and we'll pray. Okay. So with that, God, we just ask you to keep blessing us throughout this day and this week and uh, bless the food that we'll receive out there with the hot dogs and, and thank you for the, the servant-heartedness of the youth that'll be serving us with that and um, we just thank you so much for this service and for everyone here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, why don't you uh, stand up? If you do thank you. come out to pray, there's some of these um, that you can grab. I'll bring them out there, and they have suggested prayer points on them. Uh, and I'll give more instructions out there. So uh, it's 11.15, let's say 11.30 for the after-service prayer, and please go enjoy some hot dogs. God bless you.